You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach, Trip Lemire. Do you think flow or the zone is only for pro athletes, daredevils, or musicians? Do you have to risk your life in order to feel more alive? And what's the best thing to do if you feel trapped in a dead-end job? The Rise of Superman author Stephen Kotler is here to discuss the keys for experiencing flow, that peak state of mind where time shifts and our mental and physical capabilities are multiplied. Welcome to The New Man. Today, we're talking with Stephen Kotler. He's the best-selling author of The Rise of Superman. Stephen, thanks for being here today. Hello. Stephen, you there? Yeah, I'm I'm sorry. I was putting you on off speaker (laughs) so the sound was better. Something crazy (laughs) happened. I'm so sorry. (laughs) My phone exploded. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Let's just keep going. I like that. So, uh, well, before we dive in, I want to set a little context here. So many, and I think too many of the guys that are listening to the show just aren't lit up. They're not fired up. They want to feel alive. They want to have a sense of purpose. They want to have a sense of meaning. And many are just waiting until their, their best days arrive. They've got this magical idea that, that something out there is going to change, and then they're going to have the experiences that they truly want. And I, I personally think this is a powerless way to approach the world. But in your book, The Rise of Superman, you state that 71% of people are not engaged in their work or that they are actively disengaged, which means they're farting around on the internet or listening to podcasts like this instead of doing work. So you also said that two out of three of these people hate what they're doing a majority of the time. So I just, I, I found these, these statistics mind boggling. But um, so let's talk about your book a bit. You've spent some time with the action adventure athletes, the guys that are doing the crazy stuff. We've had guys like Laird Hamilton on this show. Um, I don't think it's a stretch to imagine that these guys are not bored in their life. They're not bored in the activities that they're doing. These guys are experiencing flow. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about today, which is flow. So, but how do we bridge that gap? The guy that's stuck in traffic right now, or the guy that's running on a treadmill, probably isn't going to huck himself off of a cliff or drop down the face of a 40-foot wave in order to feel alive or engaged with his life anytime soon. So I want to, I want to shift the focus on that today. But first, I want to get a little understanding of what we're talking about. What is flow, and why should we care about it? So flow is, goes by lots of names, right? Uh, depending on where you are in history, it's being in the zone, runner's high. Uh, if you're a jazz musician, a beatnik jazz musician like John Coltrane, then you were in the pocket you're a stand-up comedian, it's the forever box. If you're a basketball player today, it's being unconscious, right? So the lingo is everywhere. The term scientists prefer is flow, and we'll, we'll talk about why in half a second, but flow is defined as those moments of total absorption, where focus becomes so intense that we lose ourselves in the task at hand. Everything else just disappears. Our sense of self, our sense of self-consciousness, they vanish completely. Time dilates, which means sometimes five hours will pass by in like five minutes. And sometimes it goes the other way and it slows down. You get that freeze frame effect that's familiar to anybody who's ever been in a car crash. And throughout, all aspects of performance, both mental and physical, go through the roof. And that's critical. And that's, you know, the reason everybody should care is flow makes you better, faster, stronger, more agile, more dexterous. And we can talk about why if you want. Um, But it also, does the same thing with your brain. In flow, you're taking in more information per second. You're processing it with more of your brain. You're processing it more quickly. Flow does more than just kind of jack up uh, data processing. It also amplifies pattern recognition and future prediction. So these may seem like strange categories. They're the three fundamental building blocks, the three things they do, the brain does at a really basic level. So flow amplifies all of them. As a result, um, why should people who are non-athletes care? For example, McKinsey, business uh, consultancy, did a 10-year study. They found that top executives in flow report being five times more productive than out of flow. You've got to stop and think about that. Five times more productive is 
500% more productive. It means you could go to work on Monday, spend Monday in flow, take Tuesday through Friday off, and get as much done as your steady state peers. I like that plan. It's a good plan. All right. What, what's the, I know the science can get really complex, and you've got a, you do a really great job of, of kind of bottom lining what's going on with the brain, but in really general terms, what's happening in our brains when we experience flow? It's a huge, compl- as you pointed out, it's a big, complicated process. Um, let's just mix, let's start at the simple place. There was this old idea that I'm sure most of your listeners have heard about, which is now called the 10% brain myth. It was this idea that, hey, we only use 10% of our brain, so ultimate performance, flow, must be the whole brain functioning on hyperdrive, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Everybody's heard that. Mm-hmm. Turns out we have that exactly backwards. What happens in flow is parts of the brain aren't speeding up and becoming hyperactive. Instead, they're going the exact opposite brain direction. They're shutting down. Called transient means temporary, hypofrontality, hypo, H-Y-P-O. It's the opposite of hyper. It means to deactivate, to slow down. Frontality, the prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that's right behind your forehead where you do all your higher cognition, your problem solving, your sense of will, your sense of morality. But this part of the brain shuts off and flow. So earlier, right, we talked about time slowing down or speeding up which is something that's really common in flow. Why does that happen? Time is calculated all over the prefrontal cortex. Parts of it start to shut out, shut down. We can no longer perform the calculation. On top of that, you get alterations in in neuroelectricity and brainwaves. I'm not going to talk about that. And you get a huge kind of neurochemical dump of five of the most potent performance-enhancing chemicals the brain can produce. And I want to talk about these for half a second because, again, you asked, why is this important to the common man? So. If you want to kind of look at the world today and say, what are the three most critical skills we need? Well, people have been asking that question. IBM, for example, did a giant survey of 1,500 CEOs and said, what's the you know, global survey? What's the number one characteristic you need to run a company today? Creativity topped their lists. Creativity also tops lists of the skills our, uh, our children need to thrive in the 21st century. So creativity is very important. You opened the show talking about engagement, Right. The Gallup poll survey numbers that you ran down, as you pointed out, are astounding, right? They're insane. Yeah. Um, so motivation is another huge category, right? And the final category is the ability to learn faster. In a fast-developing world, the ability to learn faster than your competitors, as you know, business exec Ari Goose famously said, is the only sustainable competitive advantage. And there's so much data backing that up. So... We've got learning, motivation, and creativity. These are the three, three of the, maybe not, they're not, maybe there are other skills we could talk about, but they're three fundamental skills to success in the world today for anybody, action sport athletes, otherwise, right? Yeah. In flow, you get this profound neurochemical dump. So they're all performance enhancing chemicals, but they're also feel good neurochemicals. So for example, you get dopamine. Dopamine is a reward chemical. The most addictive drug on earth is cocaine. When people use cocaine, all that happens is the brain releases dopamine and blocks its reuptick, right? So you get dopamine and flow. You also get four other neurochemicals that are just as potent and just as addictive, meaning flow is the most addictive experience you can have on earth. Scientists hate the word addictive, so they use autotelic, which means an end in itself. Uh-huh. But what that means is once something starts generating flow, we will go exceptionally far out of our way get more of it, right? And you see this all the time. Surfers, not known as an exceptionally well-motivated group, right? <laughs> Yet, if it's overhead tubes, they're freaking there at five o'clock in the morning, getting into cold, clammy wetsuits and suffering through what is usually a hellacious paddle out to get to, you know, overhead tubes. Um, very motivated, like very committed. Clockwork. Yeah. Extremely motivated. You see this in coders when, you know, it's not the cold... You know, it's not the Pepsi and cold pizza that is keeping them up for three days straight to finish a great project. It's the flow being generated by that project, right? So you see this all the time. So what the reason is because flow is the most addictive experience on earth. So you get massively amplified motivation. Well, it's so, a, so it's a peak state, which has me think of drugs here. I mean, you brought it up. I got this image of Leo DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street <laughs> getting work done that way with mountains of cocaine. But, I mean, is it, is it possible to normalize something that is yeah, a peak so here, state? 
Here's what well, norm. I will. What do you What are you asking by normalized? Can what do you I mean go? Can I Can I get up every morning and go, go to if I'm a guy that drives to work or something, and I know okay, cool. I'm gonna be in flow today, and, and then tomorrow I'm gonna do the same. It just becomes the routine that I'm in flow every day. So yes and no. Um, <laughs> sorry, there's no. Let me let me give you a little context. Yeah. We now know that there are 17 flow triggers. These are preconditions that bring on more flow. Why are we seeing such craziness in action adventure sports today? Because these athletes have gotten very, very good at reliably reproducing flow states. What does that mean? That means they've packed their lives with these 17 flow triggers. But the cool thing is anybody can do the same. Now, that's part A, and we can come back to that in a second. I'm sure we will. Yeah. Part B is the answer to your question, which is kind of can I live in a perpetual flow state? The answer to that is no. We used to think flow was binary. I'm either in the zone or I'm out of the zone. Turns out the four-stage cycle. Some of the stages are very unflowy and they're not very pleasant at all. You have to move through all four stages before you can restart the flow cycle. And some of those stages can take a very long time. You know, there are ways to speed them up and there are, there are hacks and there are things you can do along the way, but you don't get to live in a perpetual flow state. Okay. And the one other thing I want to say just right now, um, this isn't self-help. And what I mean by that is to, on both sides of the coin, on the good side, self-help is like 5%, 10% gains. We're talking about a step function worth of change. I can go into why, but for example, flow is the source code of intrinsic motivation. Productivity is amplified 500%. Studies done by my organization, the Flow Genome Project, we've seen creativity amplified um, 700%. In studies run by the U.S. military on snipers, when they induce flow artificially, they found snipers and flow learned 200 to 500% faster. So it's a huge change. We're talking about a massive step function worth of change, a huge peak state. The downside is, as you pointed out, these neurochemicals are very addictive. And when you are coming out of flow, it's like coming off of drugs. It is a hard thing to deal with, and it is a dangerous thing. People don't know what they're doing. For example, creative fields demand tremendous amounts of flow to be successful. Just, it's just part of, part of it. Myself as a writer, right? I don't make a living if I can't get into flow all the time to amplify my creativity and write really well. The downside is that suicide is extremely high in the creative community. And one of the big reasons is these people get into flow states very easily, but they don't know what they are. And when they vanish, they don't know, you know, it's like the light of God shines and you and suddenly it turns off. Right, right. Suddenly it's a dark night of the soul, mm. right? That's the same thing that's going on for a lot of people. And, you know, we've got, we've done interviews with Dean Potter that are, that are online, that the climber, um, where he talks about that explicitly, he talks about it in, in the book, but there's interviews where he talks about it as well. And, you know, how dark that depression can be when you're used to getting in flow and suddenly you're cut off from the source. Mm. So my point is, this is not, you know, it's not self-help that you have to know what you're doing. You have to be smart about it. So yes, you can maximize the amount of flow in your life. You can't live there, but you can maximize the amount of flow in your life, get out incredible, incredible results, which is why we're seeing so much progression in action adventure sports and a couple other places I can talk about. Um, okay. Well, but I, the thing downside. that I'm yeah, the thing that I'm getting about this is you know we had uh, we've had uh, Navy Seal Mark Devine on the show, and he always says this things like you're capable of twenty times more than your than what you believe, like your current reality is, and that you know he, he says that because he puts people through these situations where they they rise to the challenge, they they go through some shift well, in their mentality, and, and I'm just getting that most of us, if not you know ninety nine percent of us are walking around in this reality where we have no idea what we're really capable of doing if me, we let, understood let, flow a bit more. Let's put some crazy numbers on it, just because just these numbers are people everybody can relate to. Okay. So one of the things that happens when the prefrontal cortex turns off is your sense of self turns off with it. So the part of your brain, for example, that handles impulse monitoring and uh, shuts off completely. So what we've discovered in flow this is work that came out of the University of Pennsylvania. Normally, people can access about 65% of their strength because there's a governor because you don't want to go too high because you could hurt yourself. You can train this up so professional rate weightlifters can get to about 80%. Above that, it, you can't really get to without kind of the fight or flight syndrome where the woman lifts the car off the baby. She doesn't care what happens to her body at all, right? Right. The extreme version. But what happens in flow because your sense of self turns off 
inner critic, your impulse monitoring turns off, you get access to that extra 60 to 85%. So your strength literally goes up about 25%. And because you've got a bunch of painkillers in your body, some of the neurochemicals that are shoot, shoot out kill pain, this only amplifies the response. So literally, you are physically stronger in flow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, I mean, in a nutshell, you taught, you said there were some steps. Some of them are, are not that pleasant, but they are, they are necessary to experience flow. What's, what are those steps? What are we talking about there? Okay. So it's a four stage cycle on the front end of a flow state. The first stage is it's known as a struggle. And it was uh, Herbert Benson, who's a cardiologist at Harvard who mapped a lot of the neurobiology of flow, who actually named it that. And he, it was a well-chosen name. Struggle is a loading phase. So it's skill acquisition. You are essentially overloading the brain with information. So if you're a baseball player, right, this is when you're learning how to swing a bat at a ball. Or if you're a surfer, this is when you're learning how to really like dive into your bottom turn, right? It's basic skill acquisition. It's unpleasant. You are basically repeating a pattern over and over and over again until it can move from conscious processing to subconscious processing. That takes a while. For me as a writer, right, for to translate it out of the sports world, I'm in struggle when I'm planning a new book. So at that point, my office is a giant kind of map of vector models of chapters to other chapters to other ideas to what's this over here. And I'm doing hundreds of interviews and I'm talking to hundreds of people and I'm reading hundreds of books. And I'm frustrated as hell. Mm -hmm. And the secret here, and this can take a long time. You, this, this can take a couple of hours. This can take months. It depends. It varies. But... The secret is to take yourself to the edge of frustration and then stop and you take your mind off the problem. So you move out of struggle. You literally basically want to drive yourself to the point that your brain can't take anymore and then you want to change the subject. And what I mean by changing the subject is you literally need to take your mind off the problem. So let me tell you why because it, it, otherwise it's not going to make as much sense. What happens in flow is we are trading conscious processing for subconscious processing. It's a huge difference in speed, in storage, in uh, energy efficiency. So that's the trade we're making in flow. As attention goes up and flow always follows focus, as the need for attention goes up, the brain performs a sufficiency exchange, right? It transfers information processing over to the subconscious and it starts shutting off parts of the prefrontal cortex to save energy. That's what's going on. Okay. And um, as, as that kind of takes place or for that to take place you can't be holding on tightly to the problem like if your conscious mind is still working the problem you literally can't let it go so the subconscious can't take it over um and there's neurobiology underneath that but we won't get into it right so, so but there's to, there's a recovery it sounds like there's a recovery or i know you call it release but it sounds like well, that's that what's comes, necessary that, that, that what's not release comes later okay um, or right so what you what you want to do here is go for a, a you don't want to exhaust yourself Go for a jog, build model airplane, build dinosaur models. Gar I use gardening a lot for this purpose. That's one of the things I do here. Um, you can read a book. That will work. What will not work is television. Television actually fucks with your brain waves yeah. um, and, uh, and screws up this process. So it actually, television is the one thing that movies also, they it won't really work here. Okay. Books are suspect, but they work, they work for me here. So I, I recommend them. They don't work for everybody. Usually you want a non-taxing activity that keeps your hands busy. For example, you've had this experience. Everybody's had this experience. You've been working on a problem all day, couldn't come to the solution, get in the shower to clean off the stink of all that frustration. You're soaping yourself up and the solution pops in your head. There it Why? is. Why? Because the physical act of soaping yourself up takes releases the grip of the conscious mind and allows the subconscious to take over. The subconscious is a giant pattern recognition system. It can solve problems so unbelievably fast, it's insane. Um, and by the way, if you want a demonstration, if you want to learn more about this particular process, the MacGyver method, <laughs> go just Google the <laughs> MacGyver method. This is my friend Lee Slotoff. He's literally the creative MacGyver, and he got obsessed with creative problem solving and did all this research and created kind of a problem solving method based on, on this kind of move. Um, so there's more information out there about this. It's cool, but I'm not going to talk about more. You well, go, I just think it's so, I just think it's so helpful to know that part of the process means that there's a point where you disengage, but your brain is still working on it, but you're still, you know, because a lot of guys will just keep driving their yeah, nose okay, right into so, the, into the, into yeah, the wall. Since you, brought, since you brought that up, let me just, let me go, let me go one step further and give everybody an exercise. 
You won't believe me until you try this, so just try this. This is essentially the Mega Guyver method. When you're, list, when you're done listening to this podcast, just write down whatever is the biggest problem you're facing right now. Okay? Just write it down. You have to write it down. It's important because of the way the brain works that you, you, typing it doesn't work. You need to write it down, pen on paper, and it's because of how our brain is wired with writing. Okay. We're trying to engage multiple senses besides the point. Write it down. Be as specific as possible. So I use this at the end of every writing day. I write down, okay, I, uh, tomorrow morning I would like to wake up and have a solution to the opening to Chapter 3. I would like it to be funny, sexy, highlight these three points, and you know, somehow make its way over to here. That's, I'm specific, but I, you know, I leave it open. Okay. You then take your mind off the problem for about six hours. In that period... Do something that will take your mind off the problem. So go through this exact thing. Build a model airplane, garden, whatever. Get physical exercise, but you don't want to exhaust yourself. Then, you know, and then sleep on it. Let's do it overnight because that way um, for it's, or you, you can shorten this the better at this you get. But in the beginning, do that activity and then sleep on this overnight. The next morning, wake up and start writing. Get back to your notebook. With, take out your hand. Start writing. The first thing to write is, I wonder what the answer to my question is. And just keep going. Keep, all that matters is you are moving your hand and words are coming out. Within a couple of paragraphs, you're going to have the answer to your question. What I'm, all I'm showing you is that you have a pattern recognition system for the brain and it will find solutions. I will warn you, by the way, as my partner, Jamie Wheel of the Flow Gito Project, found out the first time he tried this exercise – Careful the questions you might ask. The answers, <laughs> you, 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 like you're gonna get, you're gonna get answers, right? They may not be like he asked a deeply, deeply personal question. You know, the answer showed up. It was the exact right answer, and he was like, "Oh, damn, this is not what I wanted to know." Uh, this is gonna throw things <laughs> um, off. So, be, but be careful. That it really, it, it's a simple exercise. We do that. We do this at the Flow Genome Project when we're, you know, training people about flow because it's really, it's nice to know that you have a pattern recognition system. And you can use it, right? Most people don't actually realize they can use their brain in this way, that it will do this work automatically. So it's a, it's a big problem-solving tool, but it is also what, what I use it as a writer because when, you, when the problem is solved, I can sometimes the solution, because it will produce dopamine, whenever there's pattern recognition in the brain, dopamine is released. And everybody knows this too, by the way. If you've ever filled out a crossword puzzle, you get an answer right, there's that little rush, yeah. that's dopamine. Okay. Um, so what's cool about dopamine, one of the reasons flow gaps up creativity. Dopamine lowers signal to noise ratios, meaning it heightens pattern recognition in the brain, which is why good ideas tend to spiral. You have one new idea, something snaps together and it leads to another and another and another. That's what's going to happen in this process if you keep if you keep writing. It gets really interesting. It's really fun to play with. Anyways, okay. that's the second stage of the flow cycle. The third stage is the flow state itself. It's this huge high. You feel like Superman. You accomplish amazing things in very short time frames, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the back side of the flow state, and flow states vary in life. Some of them can be very, very brief, a couple of minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, with kind of an afterglow effect. Some of them can last a couple of hours. There are cases. Um, I, I've experienced a flow state writing a book once where I was in and out of a flow state for two weeks straight, mm. um, where I you know, I essentially wrote half of a book in two weeks' time, and I'm not even sure who wrote the book. In right. honesty, yeah. like I'm honestly, the book was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, and I'm not sure who the prize should go to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been totally truthful, um, but uh, so that can happen. And then there's a weird, there's an altruism-based flow state. So you, altruism can also bring on flow, and it's called helper's high. And helper's yeah. high can sometimes last for days. So um, how long the flow state lasts can vary. It varies in intensity. You can have micro flow, where maybe you have kind of you lose track of time and you have very kind of focused attention and then you have macro flow where, you know, time dilates and your sense of self disappears and all these incredible things happen to the spectrum. It's like anger, right? right. You be a little bit angry, a little irate or homicidally murderous. Flow is the same thing. And most people, by the way, experience micro flow about 5% of the time. 5% okay. of their work, work day is spent in, in states of micro flow. So you're experiencing this all the time. You probably just don't know what it's called. And now that you do, you'll start noticing it, it more. Macro flow is, is obviously much, much rarer, but so that's the flow state itself. On the back end of the flow state, and this is what you were talking about earlier, is um, a recovery period. All those neurochemicals are expensive to produce. 
You need sunlight. You need minerals. You need vitamins. You need certain foods to make more of them, right? So once the brain exhausts its supply, you're down for a little while. Yeah. Those are feel-good neurochemicals. They're all gone, right? There is, you know, much in the way that you're hungover after drinking too much, yeah, you're yeah. hungover after a flow state. It's, it's the same thing. It's like it's biophysically, it's like coming off of drugs, right? So the problem with this low is there are a couple of things. You need, I always say that the, the secret to surviving this low is the hangover rule. I think that most people, by the time they're, I don't know, let's not put an age on it, but after they've been drunk three or four times and hungover three or four times, you learn not to trust your brain when you're hungover. You know it's negative, you're tired, you're hungover, you're weak, you don't feel like you're best, and you're going to have all kinds of crappy thoughts. And sooner or later you learn you have to ignore them. You're like, you know what, I'll deal with all that tomorrow when I feel better. Today I'm just going to you know, ride this out. It's unpleasant, mm-hmm. right? And I think most people have that experience, learn that lesson. The same thing applies here. And the reason is twofold. One, there's accelerated learning and flow. If you start getting stressed out at not being in flow, the cortisol that you'll produce, the stress hormone, will actually block the learning you need. You need a little cortisol in your system, which is enough from not being in flow like it's there, but you too much and you block learning, right? So while flow will give you this kind of moment of peak experience, you won't get the long-term value. That's the first problem. The second problem is if you want to get back into flow, right, you have to go from this down, this recovery period, right back into the serious fight of struggle. If you're bummed out at, you know, not being Superman anymore, it is really hard to get up for the serious struggle. So the serious fight of struggle, it's yeah. just, it's just difficult. So you have to, emotional fortitude is required and you have to give your body a chance to recuperate. So when I finish, for example, when I finish a big magazine article or a big chapter in one of my books or, or anything of those sorts and the next, over the next couple of days when I go back to work and I find that I can't focus at all and my attention is flying all over the place, that's a sign. My brain has not recovered from this, this kind of big flow experience and I just need to chill out and wait until I can focus again, until it's back. And usually with a couple of days, and I really do, you know, I, I'm, I'm crazy about how hard I work. It's really hard for me to take time off, but I know that unless I do, it's only going to get worse. And you hear this you know, this is the exact opposite of what happens in society, right? What is, for, I deal with a lot of really high performance sales guys. They'll go out, they'll, you know, get into flow for a variety of reasons, right? And they'll, they'll have this great quarter where they'll beat their quotas by, you know, 200%. And what happens? Instead of afterwards somebody saying, oh, that was amazing, that was great, why don't you, you know, rest up for the next round? They're right on to the next thing. They're right on to the next thing. And what has happened is they've been like, oh my God. 200% better, that's great. We're going to double your quotas and we're going to cut your territory in half. You're a superstar, right? right. And it's Wolf on Wall Street shit. Yeah. And, right? So what happens is you're denying, organizations do this all the time, they deny their employees the very thing they need to produce those outrageous numbers and that outrage, uh, these outrageous, this outrageous creativity and everything else by rushing them from project to project without understanding that there's a biological cycle here that you can't beat. You can't like there's there's no way around it. You don't you don't you don't there's no work around. Okay. So also, by the way, one of the reasons so people ask all the time why are action sports athletes so good at at flow, right? What is the thing? One of the things it's really simple. All every one of these sports is seasonal and it's weather dependent. Big storm blows in, everybody heads to the mountain or everybody goes surfing, right? A couple days later it passes and everybody recovers. They don't have a choice. They can't just go back. They out. don't have a choice. There's no, there's no way to go back. But if you talk to, you know, Laird and the rest of the big wave crew, you know, the waves they want show up five, six times a year. Now with, you know, better, better technology, maybe 10 times a year, but it's still not, you know, day in, day out, day in, day out, day in and day out. They have built in recovery periods. It's built into the sports just because of weather. And it's a huge advantage. Well, that's, I think it's just, it's just so helpful because most of the guys that I talk to, are like, they're really focused on performance. They want to be kicking ass, and they don't understand this recovery uh, aspect of things, and, and, and they deny it, but they don't understand that it's, if they really cared about their performance, they, they really pay attention to the recovery aspect. Um, I'm, and I'm glad that we're, we're bringing this up here because it's essential to flow. It's essential to that state that we're all really seeking, whether we realize it or, or not. How, how important 
is risk in all of this? I mean, for the guy that's, you know, like I said, maybe he's he's just he's pushing pencils during the day or, or at his computer. Does risk play any part in his ability to experience flow? Yeah, great question. So we've talked earlier. I said there are 17 flow triggers. These are preconditions that bring on more flow, right? As I also said, flow follows focus. So every one of these triggers is simply a way of driving attention into the present moment, right? Flow drives attention into the now. It takes place in the now. It's the only place you can, you can find flow. So all of these 17 triggers are essentially ways evolutionary biology, sh- evolution, shaped our organism to pay attention to the present moment. They're all the things the brain thinks are fundamentally important and worth, worthy of all, our undivided attention. So as you pointed out, of these 17 triggers, um, risk is one of them. Okay. And it, it, we, we, the, the way we refer to it is high consequences. And we talk about it there. So of these 17 triggers, you've got three environmental, three psychological. So that's external triggers, internal triggers, one creative trigger, and then there are 10 social triggers. High consequences is an environmental trigger. When there are high consequences in the environment, we pay more attention to the now, right? right. Simple as that. Now, here's the cool thing. First of all, let me, let, first of all yes, you do need risk for flow. It's always going to require risk. And I'll, and I'll go into a slightly more diff, detail in a second because we'll talk about another psychological trigger, but let's just talk about the high consequence trigger. Okay. You need risk for flow. It is a huge focusing mechanism. But here's the really cool part. You don't need physical risk. Sure, the action adventure sport athletes, you know, are getting this trigger using physical risk, but you can substitute emotional risk, intellectual risk, creative risk, social risk. They all work the same way. And I mean that literally. Let me give you an example. It doesn't make sense that my fear of surfing a 50-foot wave and, you know, my fear of speaking in public should register the same. But until 300, 250 years ago, if you got kicked out of the tribe, if you got banished, if you screwed up socially, you were dead. You were dead. It was <laughs> yeah. death sentence. So yeah. The brain doesn't understand the difference between social fear and physical physical risk. Right. Same thing. Which is why, by the way, public speaking is the number one fear in the world. And it's not like you know jumping off buildings, which it should be. But no, it's public speaking because social fear registers that highly. Yeah. So here's the cool. Here's the really cool part, though. All relative. So. Laird Hamilton's got to paddle into a 50-foot wave of jaws to pull this trigger, right? But the shy guy, he's literally got to do nothing more than raise his hand and speak up at the important meeting to pull this trigger. Or the shy gal has to walk across the bar and talk to the good-looking guy. I mean, literally, it's very independent of who you are. And it's because what you're trying to get is perceived risk and real risk. They're essentially, they're very different things. We're talking about perceived risk here. And what you're really trying to get at is another dopamine dump, which is what happens in the brain whenever we take risks, right? Dopamine does a number of things. We talked about it, in impact on pattern recognition, but first and foremost, it's a focusing mechanism. Drives attention into the now, Mm -hmm. right? So it, you know, and it, of course, it shows up whenever we take a risk. So yes, you need risk for flow. The other, the second side of this is something that's really important if we're talking, you know, to, to everyday people is that one of the psychological triggers for flow, and this is probably the most famous of all the flow triggers, it's called the challenge skills ratio. What this means is we pay the most attention to the present moment to what we are doing when the challenge of what we are doing slightly exceeds the skills we're bringing to bear. So we want a challenge that makes us stretch but not snap, right? So every time you go after that challenge, there's obviously risk involved. Now, here's the caveat, and here's where things get screwy, and this is where it's important. For underachievers, and there probably aren't that many listening to your podcast, but for underachievers, the problem with this stretch but don't snap sweet spot for flow is that we're stretching when we feel uncomfortable, right? If Mm -hmm. I am, if I want to get to this sweet spot, one good signal that I'm there is that I'm pretty uncomfortable with what's going on. I am no longer at ease. I have pushed past my comfort zone. Yeah. And I'm uneasy about it. I'm not psyched about it. So for people on that end of the spectrum, you have to get really good, comfortable with being uncomfortable. You have to realize that that uncomfortability is your friend. It's driving your attention into the the now. And provided you can keep your fear in check, and we'll talk about that in a second, provided you can keep your fear in check, it's your gateway into flow. So that's great. For overachievers, 
They have the opposite problem. This sweet spot is so low down, that meaning like I'm uncomfortable, that overachievers, I'll blow by it, for example, 25%, 50%. I'll take on a massive project because, you know, that's just who yeah. I am and that's who most high performers are. And it's way too big. You need to chunk it down. So like people who are really good at this, right? You may set a huge goal and setting huge goals is important. But you have to chunk it down into bite-sized chunks that are it, that sit in this challenge skill sweet spot. Otherwise you're screwed because you're going to deny yourself flow because what's going to happen is if when you 25%, 50%, sounds like a good idea at the time. You get in there and you realize, holy crap, this is huge. You start to get really scared. The flow exists sort of near the midpoint between boredom, I'm not interested enough, so I'm not paying attention, and anxiety. Uh, there's too much fear here. There's too much stimulation, and I can't slip into flow. I think that anxiety will, again, block flow. So it's a, it's a careful balance. You have to get to know yourself well. You have to play with this a lot to get it right, and it's just self-experimentation um, to figure out kind of what's ideal. But, you know, for your audience, their problem is they're going to blow past it. Yeah, well, I'm just, I just want to underline a couple of things because most of us, whether we realize it or not, if we're unconscious, we're going to try and create our life in, in service of more comfort, more safety, more predictability, and that's what's going to kill flow. Um, but if we can start to befriend that that edgy zone, that, that growth zone, where it's just a little bit, that 5%, 10% just beyond our comfort zone, that's where we're going to get the most bang for, for the effort. We don't have, I, so many of us are, are like, if I want to make a big change, or if I want to have a, a, a different experience in my life, I must have to do something drastic. That's where they go into this lockdown of like, oh no, I'm going to have to make a big change in my life if I want to have a, a different experience in my life. And what I'm gathering from this is like, no, you just need to find that edge and t to just stick your toe over it. Start to stretch it a little bit, and you'll actually start to experience flow more. You'll 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 have the, more of that enjoyment. If you were to do something that was way beyond that, you'd overload your system. You'd be terrified, and you'd have a shitty experience of your life. Absolutely. Let's talk about a couple a couple more things just to round this out for for all your listeners. Okay. One, I want to talk about why passion is important. Right? You hear this a lot. People talk about flow, and you know, flow shows up when you're very, very passionate. People talk about passion as if it was something magical and mystical. The only reason passion matters here is because we pay more attention to those things we care deeply about. So why do you want to do the things we're passionate about? Because life satisfaction is going to go up, first of all. And second of all, because it's going to produce more flow. Right? So that was, it's a side point, but I wanted to just yeah. mention it. The other thing I wanted to say, since we've spent a bit of time kind of talking about little flow hacks and things people can do, and we talked about the kind of uh, the pattern recognition hack, I want to mention one other thing. So uh, one of the other psychological triggers is known as immediate feedback, right? And all this means is we have the most attention stays better, stays in the, in the present moment when we don't have to wonder how to course correct, right? If you know, if you have immediate feedback, right? You don't have to wonder what to do next. You always kind of know how to improve your behavior. And this yeah. is automatic in action sports. Why are these guys so good at it? It happens automatically. I set my ski edge on the top of that coir, or I'm on a face-first dead slide to the bottom, right? right? You miss your bottom turn, you're going to end up at, 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 at the bottom of the impact zone, right? It's just that simple. works automatically. So you need to tighten feedback loops. And this is really fundamental because without these feedback loops, performance goes down. So in medicine, Literally every class of physician there is gets worse after medical school, except for surgeons. They get better. Why? Somebody dies on the table. It's immediate feedback. I'd say so. Yeah. So, so here's <laughs> right. So here's the, now. This is what I want to talk about. Cause, and, and I, by the way, I don't have a total answer here for everybody. I'm just sure. I wanted to throw it out. Yeah. Um, I think. I, there's a guy on my payroll whose job it is. When I write something, I send it to him. And he calls me up and he tells me three things. He tells me if it's boring, if it's confusing, or if it's arrogant. Because I've discovered that bad writing, I am, you know, I am off. If my writing is boring, arrogant, or confusing, I'm off target. I'm going okay. in the wrong direction. I'm wasting my time. It's my minimal feedback for flow, basically. 
the three things I need to know to be able to go back and do another round of editing, right? Oh, I think so that's I so great because otherwise you have to wait until you publish an article or you hear from or an editor. I yeah. it to an editor or anything yeah. else, right? It was what I started to realize, and a lot of this, I, you know, before I wrote Rise of Superman, I wrote a book with Peter Diamandis called Abundance, and having Peter to bounce ideas back and forth with. You know, I went from the last time I wrote a book before Peter took me three years. Peter and I wrote Abundance in about, a, a, I think, 13 months. Oh. And the reason was I had constant immediate feedback. Somebody else cared about what I, what I did, so I could call him. And all I, all, essentially, you know, what Peter did was tell me, you know, was I, was I on topic or off topic? You know what I mean? I mean, he mm-hmm. did some writing, and there was, it was much more equal than that. But, like, that was what I got from Peter, and I went, holy crap. I need to get somebody on my staff who does this. That's so great. So I figured out what is the minimal feedback I need for flow, and I put that mechanism in place. Everybody should put that mechanism in place. And if you can afford it, I honest to God, don't use friends. Because what happens is, as you start to depend on this, and you will, you will start producing more flow, and you'll start to depend heavily on it. You're going to start driving your friends crazy, driving your spouse crazy, driving your girlfriend or boyfriend crazy. It's better if you can pay somebody a little bit to do it. It's far better. Well, I, there's just another point here where a lot of guys get into this place where they fantasize about this big picture, this big vision, and then they they go into this self deprivation mode. It turns into this finish line or this summit. And once I get there, then I'm going to have the experience I want instead of having something where they're you know where they're navigating based on the experience as they go, and they're using the experience to guide them. They've shut down that guidance system, and they're only focused on this thing they have in their mind. And that can be cool for a while, but I, I think where they miss is they miss that experience of flow because they're just like, I'm, I'm, I can only, you know, it's that whole the whole standard American dream, like I yeah, wait, wait know, until Philip, I retire, you know, and then I'll, then I'll be Zimbardo, happy. Philip Zimbardo, who's a, a time researcher at Stanford, wrote a really great book on this called The Time Paradox. Right. And what you're talking about. So we have something called time orientation. It's, it's somewhat genetic. It's somewhat shaped by society, but it's fundamental. Some people, for example, in Catholic countries, they have a predominance of people who believe in perfect pasts. They look back to this nostalgic, perfect past, and that's their anchor. And that's where they live. People in the West, especially in North America, especially your audience, they have they focus on the future. Everything will get better when I do this. It's delayed gratification, right. right? The problem is it pulls you out of the present moment, so you can't find flow. You actually I mean there's also, by the way, there's another problem with is people who are really sucked into the present moment, they're called present hedonists. They live for the now and they can never, you know, gain the skills and put in the grudge work to get to that better future. Right. So what they've discovered is the best time orientation to have is something that blends present hedonist with this future orientation. What am I doing now that's also in service of the future? Well, here's, here's the interesting thing. Flow does it automatically. And the reason is flow mm-hmm. produces what I call the high perch experience. So I get asked a lot by people who are stuck in dead-end jobs. What do I do? I have a job I can't stand, but I've got a mortgage. I've got a wife. I've got kids. I don't know what to do. I need the money. <laughs> what I always say is, what you need to do, you need to find a hobby. I don't care if it's playing the fiddle, painting watercolors, gardening, whatever, that produces flow. Playing a musical instrument, whatever. And the reason is, sure, flow will, you know, it'll up life satisfaction. We know from research going back to the 70s that the people who score off the charts for life satisfaction are the people with the most flow in their lives. doesn't so matter a, where it is. It doesn't have to be your job, just any kind of, yeah, any, any doesn't experience. matter where it is. Yeah. Um, it, right. So, directly correlates, but what happens in flow is you get this high perch experience. So you're, you're, it raises you up, you feel like Superman, and it's not only you're doing the stuff you're doing now, and you're, wow, that's amazing, but you start to get this vision of what your life like could be like if you could access the state more often, if you could be like this. So it gives you a vision of the future. And what I've discovered after 15 years of kind of teaching people this material, and I, I've got no data to back this up, but what I can tell you anecdotally is People start getting more flow in their lives. They have these experiences, and they start seeing how their new hobby might intersect with their old job and lead in a direction that they haven't seen before. To borrow um, biologist Stuart Kaufman's phrase, flow unlocks the adjacent possible. Oh, I love it. Okay. All right, so then what's, the, what's one thing a guy can do today 
to create more flow in his life. Tell us about your uh, the Flow Genome Project and the things you guys you guys got going on there. Yeah, that's that's. When, 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 while you're waiting for the book to show up, go to the Flow Genome Project website, which is flowgenomeproject.co, C-O, um, and we have a free flow profile. It's on the front page. Everybody gets into flow differently, meaning everybody is more susceptible to different flow triggers than others, right? We all have, we all, some people like high risk. Some people get into computer coding. Some people get into building model airplanes, blah, blah, blah. So these, we have a, we have a simple kind of 10 person, 10 questions, uh, survey that basically identifies which of the major four categories you'll fit in. So it gives you a quick look at which direction to start hunting flow more in your life. In. Awesome. All right. Stephen Kotler, The Rise of Superman. That book is available everywhere. And tell me, is it uh, the, the flowgenomeproject.co? Is that correct? That is correct. All right. We're going to have the links up on the website. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much, man. This is, I, I, I got my brain blown open, even though I read the book. Um, but I, I just, I'm imagining what's possible. Like, man, is the more, the more that you guys reel in this information and start to make it more available to the rest of us, what's going to be possible. I just, I'm, I'm very excited. Thank you so much for doing this work. Hey, Trip, my pleasure. Glad I could help. If these interviews are helping you, then please visit the new man on iTunes and leave us a positive review so others can discover the show more easily. Thanks for listening.